Once again, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you, both those on site and those joining us online, to the 6th Tao Tiang Sing Distinguished Lecture Series, The View in Autumn, in celebration of World Mental Health Day. Kindly note that this event will be recorded for archival and marketing purposes. NUS and our partners may use some of the images and videos in online and print publications. For those joining us online, should you need any assistance, please use the chat function and my colleague will be assisting you. Today's event is organized by the Mind Science Center with support from Mr. Tao Heng, Tia, Tao Heng Tan and donors who supported Mind Science Center's mission to improve mental health and resilience across all ages. Fully dependent on grants and donations, Mind Science Center is deeply grateful for all your support. This year's theme for World Mental Health Day is Make Mental Health and Wellbeing a Global Priority for All. While the pandemic continues to take its toll on our mental health, there are preventive measures that, to build resilience and reduce the risk of, Ill, of mental ill health. Mind Science Center, with the support of Professor Hong Hai, has put together Asian-centric, evidence-based resources on dementia prevention, management, and self-help to empower the community to take ownership of their own mental health and also contribute to mental health and well-being in their own communities. May I invite the Vice Chairman of Mind Science Center, Professor Kwa E. Hock, Tan Gyeok In Professor in Psychiatry and Neuroscience at NUS and Emeritus Consultant at NUH to tell you more. Prof Kwa, please. Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas. It is a beautiful and cool October day. Um, some of our friends who are watching from North America uh, and understand it's uh, the fall season with the beautiful autumn leaves. And there are many more in uh, Australia, on the southern hemisphere. It's springtime. Um, but here in Singapore, we are still in summertime. And um, I want to welcome all of you to this, uh, this seminar. Several years ago, um, the late uh, President S.R. Nathan uh, invited me for dinner and he told me something very interesting. He said that all of you have done wonderful for, wonderfully well for Singapore and US. We are publications in the big journals of the world, in the Lancet, uh, BMJ, Nature. The, the ranking of NUS has gone up. But he told me that most of us don't read all these papers, you know. We, are, we don't know what, where, where to find the, the, the papers, you know. And what do they mean, by the way? So he, he told me that you should put all your research papers into a simple book for us to read. So we have two books now, one called The Colors of Aging and the other Aging with Dignity. It summarizes our 35 years of research on dementia. The first study on dementia in Asia, part of the World Health Study, was conducted, um, in fact, at the May Wong Day Center. And um, the most senior or the oldest person in this room is none other, it's not Professor Wang Gangu, you know, it's none other than Mrs. Betty Chen. And Betty, yeah. Why is Betty relevant to us? Because Betty and her mother started the first day center for dementia 35 years ago. And that was the site of the World Health Study for dementia. So you're very glad, uh, Betty. Thank you very much. Um, and after uh, doing the study, we did the first study in Asia on dementia prevention. Uh, and it's summarized in this book called Aging with Dignity. And, However, we realized that even as we publish this paper, even in NUS, in the Faculty of Medicine, not pe many people have read the papers. So our colleague, uh, Professor Hong Hai, said, well, there's a new media we should get, get onto, the, the digital media. And he suggested that we should um, think about putting it in the website, and he gave us a donation to spruce up our website uh, and start a new portal. So I want to invite Professor Hong Hai to say a few words and to launch the website on Dementia Asia. <laughs> Prof Hong Hai is a former dean of a business school uh, in NTU. You see that um, we involve many people outside of NUS. Earlier, the singers, one is Professor Lim Su Pin is from N um, SMU and um, Professor Tan Ting Wee from uh, A-Star and um, Dr. Ling Sting Ling from MOH previously. Right? 
Hong Hai, please. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chong, Chairman, uh, Professors Kwai Yi Hock, John Wong, Professor Wong Gangwu, Mr. Abdullah Tamugi, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> I'm very pleased and honoured to participate in the launch of the Mind Science Centre portal called Dementia Asia. We all know that Singaporeans are rapidly ageing. In 1971, in 31, Singaporeans were over the age of 65. In 2030, it will be one in four. This is an eight-fold increase in just 60 years. This is reason to celebrate. Our healthcare system is working. It's enabling us to be physically healthier and to live longer. <clears throat> but people with dementia are also living longer. This is challenging to family caregivers and to state resources. In this respect, the NUS Mind Science Center can and has played a very useful role. It has pioneered research in non-drug non ways of preventing and slowing down dementia. These include the famous Jurong Aging Study and the Age Well Everyday programs. Pharmaceutical companies have made enormous investments to discover drugs to cure, to slow down Alzheimer's. After many years of effort, there has been no success. Perhaps there can never be effective treatments by drugs alone. Like many chronic diseases of aging, dementia is related to lifestyle, diet, physical exercise, mental activities that stimulate and challenge the brain. These have proven to be the more effective ways to prevent and to treat early dementia. The new Dementia Asia website shares research experience and resources with the public, not only in Singapore but in Asia and, and, and the world over. Among other things, it features work done at the NUS Mind Science Centre. It will complement the Singapore government's healthier SG and the successful ageing projects. We hope it will also make a contribution to the global fight against dementia. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Hong Hai. May I invite you to the centre of the stage for the launch? May I also invite Dr. Cheong Chung Kong, Chairman of Mind Science Centre, Prof. Kwa E. Hock, and Associate Professor Rati Mahendran, and Associate Professor John Wong up on stage for the launch. Okay, ready? One, two, three. our new portal so you may access the Dementia Asia portal through our website at mindsciencecenter.sg. Uh, we are now invite Dr. Cheong to present a token of appreciation to Professor Hong.
So written by 79 years old Mr. Kung Chun Singh, the calligraphy describes the vastness of one's heart like the ocean and the virtue of selflessness, embracing diversity to be a blessing to the community. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. May we have another round of applause. And uh, may I invite you back to your seats? Earlier on, uh, Professor Hong Hai mentioned correctly that you, you cannot find a drug for the, the treatment of dementia. Um, in fact, when this book was reviewed in the British Journal, uh, The Colors of Aging, the professor who reviewed the book mentioned that um, this book should be read by Bill Gates because five years ago, Bill Gates told the world he'll give 100 million US dollars to whoever can find a drug for the prevention of dementia. And the reviewer, Professor Holmes from London, said, you can never find a drug. You should re read this book from Singapore on prevention. Earlier on at a foyer, someone asked me, who is Tao Tian Sing? Is he a politician? We see a philanthropist, he is neither. All right. um, he, he was a, a poor immigrant who came to Singapore uh, some 80 years ago. Like many of our forebears, he came here to find a job uh, because of the turmoil in, in China. And he um, imbued in his uh, children. Uh, a sense of, of uh, filial piety, care, and concern. And these are precious values. You can be poor but still have a sense of dignity. The first Tao Tian Singh lecture was delivered by Professor Norman Sartorius, the Director of Mental Health at the World Health Organization, Geneva. The second was Professor Hong Hai. The third, um, uh, Maestro. Jeremy Montero is down there, and um, he uh, also a professor of, of music in uh, London. In fact, this Sunday he's organizing um, a seminar on music is good for mental health. Um, and the fourth is Professor Fu Kion Tak from SGH. And today we are very glad to have two non-medical speakers. Shall we welcome them on board? Um, professor Wang is coming up. Um, Mr. Abdullah Tamuji. We, we want to reinforce that the study of aging is not just about genetics and MRI brain scan. It's also about the humanities, about ethics, about philosophy, about anthropology, about sociology, and, and they are here to give us an idea about their, their life experiences. Um, and I will begin with a few words about P Professor Wang Gangu, who is coming along the way now. Uh, Prof. Wang is, um, has, has won all the accolades of a distinguished professor, um, the NUS professor of, of in uh, in uh, the social sciences, also in Australia, emeritus professor in Australian National University, and he has also been awarded the Order of Australia, the Commander of the British Empire, and by the Singapore President Distinguished Service Order. 
And just last month, he won the uh, Singapore Literary Prize for his book, Home is Where We Are, which we'll talk about later on. And in the book, you'll realize that he, he, he tells us that he was born in Surabaya, in, in uh, Ipoh, and uh, father came to uh, Malaya, at the time called Malaya, and was at Ipoh. And he has a number of Ipoh friends here, like um, lawyer Lim Ta Hua. We also have uh, later, earlier on uh, Professor Yo Kian Hing and uh, our, our judge Daniel Ko. They're all the Ipoh friends. And, and even now they're watching from Ipoh. M many doctors are watching from Ipoh. And from Ipoh, he was um, a student at Nanjing University. But because of the civil war between uh, Mao Zedong and uh, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, his father persuaded him to come back, and then he went across, he went over to Singapore, um, where he studied history in the University of Malaya in Singapore. Um, and from there, he uh, became a lecturer, uh, and he went up to KL to be the uh, professor of history in KL. Uh, and... Um, it was in there that he has many, many friends. Uh, um, many of them are viewing, uh, I told him this morning, many of his students are, are viewing the webinar now. There is um, Mickey Kwa, who is a classmate of Dr. James Ku, and also uh, Lao Chi Eng, a classmate of Hong Hai. They're all watching from KL. And from uh, KL, he was invited to be the, uh, the chair over at the Australian National University in the uh, Far Eastern History Institute. And from then, he was invited to Hong Kong as the uh, Vice Chancellor of, of the Hong Kong University. And from Hong Kong, he was back here in Singapore as the chair of the uh, East Asian Institute. It's a long journey, isn't it, for, for a professor, you know. Some 2,500 years ago, the Greek philosopher Socrates said, wrote, I consider an elderly person like a traveler who has been on a long journey, a journey which I will have to take. I want to ask him, is the journey, is the road rough and smooth or straight and winding? So we're here to listen to Professor Wang Gangu about his journey. And um, shall we welcome our most admired NUS professor, Professor Wang Gangu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kua. I have to say that uh, I feel a little bit surprised to be with this gathering. Uh, I have never understood what aging meant or paid much attention to it until I met Professor Kua. He mentioned this to me and uh, reminded me that I was aged. <laughs> of course, being aged is one thing. How does the process of aging happen is another thing. I mean, I became aged without thinking of aging. So I don't know what it means to be actually aging. Uh, I, I presume it is over a long period of time. I suspect my innocence or my ignorance about aging comes from something that happened when I was very young. Uh, when I was in my 20s, uh, one day I, my mother called me in. And my mother was about, just about 50. And she t said to me, sat me down very solemnly, told me that she was old. <laughs> she was very serious, but I thought for, she was just playing with words, but she, she said she was old, and I never thought of it. And the reason why she did that was because she belonged to a generation when lots of people died at 50. And uh, his, her own father and mother, this is my grandparents on my mother's side, both died at 50. And so when she became 50, she thought she should alert me that she was old, prepare me for 
that fact. And in other words, from now onwards, when I, from her 50 onwards, I would have to treat her as somebody old and show her, I don't know what exactly she expected because she didn't actually spell it out, but she just kept on reminding me that I, she was old. Well, okay, I noted that fact. Then I actually forgot about it because she was actually in very good health and she lived on for another 38 years and she died at 88. So you can imagine that from her 50th, that 50th birthday warning to me until she died, I never thought of, of old because she had started me so young that when I was only in my 20s thinking that she was old and she lived to 88, I'd forgotten all about it because she was obviously going to live on and all that time she was relatively healthy. In fact, I'm not sure she really had any serious problem until I think in the early 80s she needed an operation. I think it was a hernia operation of some kind and uh, she went to hospital. But after that, I think she deteriorated quite fast. And at the age of 80, very peacefully, and without any serious problems, and as far as I know, she never complained of any pain or any particular problem. Uh, she died uh, quite suddenly, and, uh, and I realized that, well, she's passed it. But again, then I thought, there's not much to being old or being aging because watching my mother over those 38 years, I never felt there was something very particularly difficult or complicated about life because she, was, she lived a very happy life, was a great grandmother to her grandchildren, very good to us, to me and my wife, and she provided uh, wisdom, words of wisdom, continual advice about how to live and so on, in a sort of general chatty family context. And of course, I took it as just normal, what we do, what families do, what parents talk, tell their children about, and never thought about it. Now, I never thought that had anything to do with aging, to be quite frank. And so when Professor Kwar approached me about aging, I really didn't know where I could come in and fit in and be useful to this uh, distinguished lecture. In fact, I must say, I, I must take this opportunity of congratulating the Tao family for supporting this distinguished lecture, but I didn't feel I was really qualified. But uh, at the same time, he was, um, Professor Kwa is a very persuasive man. I think most of you will agree that he can be very persuasive. He persuaded me somehow that I had something to say, simply because I was aged. I must have been through it. <laughs> so tell us about aging. So I had to go back and think about it. Uh, so he, he did me a service in a way because he forced me to recollect what it meant all those years. What, what were the bits of my life that can help me understand what aging meant? And it was very nice because I, I looked back and I thought my mother was very healthy. What did she do? What did she say to me that might have been relevant to the process of aging that had led me to my present age? And uh, certain things came back to me. For example, she was always very concerned for her health. And I remember that now. Now, I never thought about it before, but now I remember that. She was always very health conscious. She was always very careful about what she ate, what she drank. Uh, she had come from China to the tropics uh, as, uh, as my father's wife. Yeah, they, in fact, they got married and my, my father took her to uh, Surabaya in Java uh, for the first time. She been living in the tropics and she was very conscious that everything about the tropics was very different from her hometown in Jiangsu, north of the Yangtze. So she felt the need to be very careful about her health. And then she keeps on telling me every now and then, now you see all these things come back because of Professor Kwa forcing me to think about it. She was very always conscious of the fact that when she was pregnant and gave birth to me, she had considerable difficulty. Uh, I sometimes wonder whether there was a reason why she didn't have another child. <laughs> one, one was enough of a problem. 
But as a result, I have no brothers and sisters, so all her attention was on me. And while she was conscious of her own health, she was also conscious of how I was brought up. And of course, when I was a baby, I was very sickly. I suffered from asthma. I remember my mother reminding me how she went through all that and a number of other things, things that children have. I think I have diphtheria, I had chicken pox, and various other things like that. Um, mumps, I think I had mumps, I remember that. So I've been through all that, and each step of the way, of course, always worried my mother. Uh, she came from a family in which they were well, well off enough for her never to be concerned about such matters in the household. So she never really knew what it meant to look after a baby. It, had I been born in China, she would probably, the kind of family she had, she would probably had a couple of maids to look after me, and she would never have to bother the kind of xiaojie in the family, would never have to bother about such things like bringing up a baby. But in the topics, uh, the way it was, she had to pay attention. So all these memories of her being paying attention to health, and obviously paying attention to my health, watching what I ate, and of course, she was very careful. She was very careful about what I ate, never, never gave me anything sweet. I never had, in fact, I never, I don't remember having any sweets uh, in, 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 for, and for breakfast, it was always quick, 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 quick oats, quick oats. And uh, obviously that was good for me. So all this just to, to, to say that she was attentive. So when I grew up, I had very little interest in food. I had very simple tastes. I never had any rich food. I, in, we didn't have any, any tropical fruits, no tropical fruits. Heaty, she said. So I had, uh, she, she only had oranges and apples. And uh, she would always make sure that's the only fruit I had. So what I'm really basically saying was that I grew up with an attentive mother who made sure that I did all the right things, as it were, in her eyes, and actually developed in me all those habits without my knowing. I was totally unconscious, but what I do know now, looking back at my life, was that I was always very simple about my food. I ate very simply. I never expected any rich food, never asked for it, never missed it. And uh, the simpler the food, I took everything, whatever was put in front of me, I ate. But that's what I was trained to do, so to speak, without being conscious of it. And that, I would say, has been true all my life. I've never been particular about food and remain so today. And I've never any any difficulty. My only problem at the moment as I recognize my aging process, is that my stomach has shrunk. So I just eat less. I just can't eat. Uh, as I was explaining to my f f colleague, uh, mind is, doesn't control matter all the time. In this case, matter controls the mind. My stomach tells me, stop eating. And then I, I, I stop. Because if I eat any more than that, I feel very uncomfortable. So it's my body that is telling me, don't do it. So you can see my life, my life doesn't tell me anything about aging. So what I did was to read Professor Kwa's book <laughs> about aging to find out what it is all about. Uh, all the contribution that he has made, all the tremendous amount of research that he has done about aging in, in this part of the world, the contributions that have t told us all about all the things to watch out for and the things that we need to care for as our society gets more and more aged. So I, I'm very sympathetic. I'm now a, a, a devotee. I'm, I'm a, a loyal follower of Professor Kwa now. I now pay, pay attention to people's aging, and I realized how little I know, how much I have to learn, and so on. But also, at the same time, looking back, because he, 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 he basically persuaded me to think about it. This is a serious subject. Don't just push it aside or, or think it's not important. So I have actually been thinking more about it since then. And then I remember more about my life, which I think is probably relevant. Uh, he reminded me that I, I wrote a book about my childhood and my uh, time as a young man as, with my wife. We, we wrote a book together. Uh, the first one was called Home is Not Here. 
The other one was called Home is Where We Are. The second one is probably more relevant because that was something new to me. Apart from growing up with my mother, which was very straightforward, I got married and I was very, very lucky. Now looking back on it, on writing the book uh, with my wife, we, she was not well by that time, but when we, I wrote the book, I realized that happiness in the family, to have a loving wife who cared for you, who did things for you without even your asking or without your thinking about it, actually in ways of course which are, or first in my mind, I have to say, not as good as my mother, but she was not my mother after all, she was my wife. She would have some expectations of me, but in her loving way, she never made that into any kind of burden on me. She made sure that my work, my life, my profession, my needs, as it were, would come before her own. And in her way, partly, again, now I think about it, she too had a very similar upbringing in one sense, although she comes from a bigger family. She also lived a very simple life. No particular needs about food, no particular demands about rich food or being choosy about your food. So in the, from that point of view, we started, as it were, on the same footing. But other than that, she had one thing which I never did, which was she was very good at games. She was extremely good in all sorts of sports, just naturally inclined that way, and did it very, to me, easily. Whereas I found all sports very demanding and testing, and most of the time I lost, so I, I didn't particularly care for it. I never seemed to be able to win any table tennis matches or badminton matches. I tried, but uh, never successful. So I've never very thought much about sports. I thought that's something I'm no good at, and I lose most of the time anyway. So I never paid much attention to that. So my looking back on it, I can't say that I had a healthy life. If you, when, when I read about it today, about what you must do, keep, back, keep fit, and so on and so forth, I don't think I ever did anything that I was consciously doing it to do to keep myself fit and healthy. The word somehow never came up in my consciousness. What did happen was I was regularly sick. Uh, nothing big. Regularly, a bit of flu, coughs and colds, uh, having to see the doctor now and again. I think the, mate, the most dangerous illness I ever had was a malaria when I was a boy in Ipo, and that nearly killed me. But because it didn't kill me, I think it made me much stronger. I think I was having survived that. But looking back, I was never seriously sick, but regularly sick. And that's very strange. So that my wife has the impression I was not a healthy person. She was actually much more concerned about the fact that I was regularly uh, sick and having to go to bed for 24 hours or two days and had to uh, ask for leave and so on. And that is true. Most of my life, I was the one who was regularly sick and my wife was never sick. I don't remember her going to the doctors or anything until very much later in life. Only in her 70s did she develop something serious. And of course, it was very serious. She, she had Parkinson's. And that was something that when I read about it, I realized what, how serious it was. And there was nothing I could do about it. But all that time, of course, she took for granted I was the unhealthy one that she had to look after me to make sure to try and keep me healthy. And whereas I never thought of looking after her until she, I discovered that she had Parkinson's, so I started to look after her. Now again, I've not done it consciously, but again, Professor Kwa has reminded me to think about it. And during the, the, during the years when my wife was deteriorating in her health, I was actually getting more and more seriously unhealthy. Without my knowing, I was not aware of it at the time, but looking back, I think that was what was happening because I was, then became concerned for her, I became more, more conscious that she needed me. Uh, but even then, I, I don't know what it is. I think this is where I'm a very bad uh, student of uh, statistics or economics or whatever. I had read somewhere that on the average, 
on the average for the statisticians that's very important that uh, women live longer than men so I've always assumed all my life that uh, I will go first so I will never have to uh, uh, I will never have to work, look after uh, her in her old age I will go first and uh, in, in a way even my wife took it for granted because I was so sickly so regularly sick that uh, I would one day just go before her. So the idea that I would live longer than her had never occurred to me until very late, until it was too late to do anything about it. But then I realized it's something else. So as I wrote about it, and I think about it today, even as I wrote about it while she was in her last, last few months of palli palliative care, I realized that the happiness that she provided in the family, the way she without de demonstrating it in any clear sense, but the way she deeply cared for me, then looked after me and provided for all the things so that I never had to think about it and took it for granted, was tremendously important to my mental health as well as to my physical health. So looking back, and I think it comes out a bit in the book that we, we produced together when I quote some of her stories, that somewhere subconsciously I was growing aware of it but I have to admit that it was Professor Quad that made me who made me aware that something that was at there all along all those years that I had been taking for granted was absolutely vital to the longevity that I enjoy and she was not too bad too she lived till 87 and we had 65 years 65 happy years together. And to my mind, that is probably the biggest and most important contribution to my being aged today and still around and standing before you. So I have to say, that's the secret to me. Since then, it's, uh, it's one of the ironies, since then I've been more conscious of my health. And not because of you, I've actually started earlier before that. I started to going out walking regularly. So I do now actually think of doing exercises, but nothing, nothing hard, like hard work, just walk. And now I realize, and I've learned it over the last two, two and a half years since my wife died, I've learned that actually when I walk and come back from a walk, I feel better. And if I don't walk for a day or two, I feel worse. I feel lethargic. I feel very uncomfortable and not sure what, I, what I'm doing. But if I walked regularly, the more regular I am in just walking half an hour, one hour, that's all you needed, I felt better each time. So in that strange way, I now prescribe walking, at least from my own experience, as the least you can do. I'm sure you can do all sorts of other exercises and many of you are probably very fine sportsmen, have done wonderful things in your youth and keep very healthy. But in my case, having done nothing like that, I played no games, no sports whatsoever, did no regular exercises, and what is always a bit puzzled as to why other people exert themselves so, so much in the sports field. Uh, have, having survived all that, and finally in my old age, I now realize I better stop this process of aging too fast. Maybe I can slow it down a bit by walking regularly. So on that very simple note, thank you all very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wang. Um, so much we can learn from you. Um, the next speaker is familiar to most of us. Uh, he was the former Member of Parliament, Cabinet Minister and Speaker of Parliament. Um, trained um, in urban sociology and statistics in NUS and also University of London. We are both editors of a book called Profiles in Resilience, which uh, tells the story of, um, written by many people in this room, we conducted a, a, a study walking mindfully through the rainforest in Singapore 
And after the walk, each of them tell us their story. And many of them are here. Uh, Shirley, Jeanette, Sing Ling, uh, um, Yong, Yong Su, Eng uh, uh, Hyong, uh, uh, Jun Hua, uh, Ling Sing Ling. So many of them. And they tell us the story. And you realize that they, they come from very humble beginnings. Even one of them living in abject poverty. But they've risen up. So the story mirrors the rise of Singapore from third world to first. All right. And when I wrote something about Mr. Abdullah Tamuji, I mentioned that he personifies fairness, moral courage, and mental fortitude. He's a very versatile person. In school, in Raffles Institution, he played rugby. And um, this year, there was a musical uh, produced by... Um, Marian Tan and uh, Duane Lau, and he could not only sing and act, he can even dance. Yeah. A bit like our Dr. C.K. Chiong, you know. And he, he plays the cello. And my wife was reading a cookbook, and he said, Hey, your friend, he can cook very well uh, Spanish food, but it's something he incapable of. Yeah. He's a man incapable of malice. And he has empathy and also a very good listener. And these are the qualities. I'm sure his cousin-in-law, Dr. Wong Bing Cheong, an experienced neurologist, will tell you, these are the qualities of a good psychotherapist. And so, shall we welcome Mr. Abdullah Tamuji? You're very naughty, actually. <laughs> uh, Dr. Chong, Dr. John Tan, Dr. John Wong, ladies and gentlemen, I'll have you know that it's very, very intimidating to be standing here next to Prof. Wang Gang Wu, who's so eminent, so respected scholar. Uh, I have nothing much to tell about uh, my aging years. Uh, I just turned 78 last August. Uh, when I saw the title of this talk, View in Autumn, it's indeed autumn for us. Uh, because you'll never know when the the green leaves will turn yellow into orange and to brown and to fall down to the ground in the cold of winter. Looking at what's happening in the world right now, I mean, fighting everywhere, competition everywhere, people living in abject poverty, poverty, hating each other. Now, I just read a human development report for 2122 uh, by the UNDP, which is the United Nations, uh, United Nations Development. <laughs> now, among the findings they wrote was, the world faces a troubled future. Threats leading to unprecedented uncertainties around the world. It is a, indeed chilling, the things you read in the report. It further mentions that uh, the UNDP estimates about one billion, one billion people in this whole world, or one in eight, have mental health problems. And the phrase they use, mental health is under assault, is really, really scary. And what causes all this mental illness is anxiety, depression. These are most of the cases of, of, of uh, mental problems nowadays. 
So, it does. Is this really something very close to my heart? And indeed, it should be close to our hearts. Because it studies how the human mind adjusts to the environment. Some can do it, many don't. Some still struggle at it. And when the Mind Science Center asked me to speak, again, with much trepidation I received because Professor Wang is here, it's because they thought that I could share some experiences along the way during my spring, summer, and now into autumn that I could share with you. And perhaps we have some help or assistance what to do and perhaps again what not to do in life. Now, each of us has our own coping mechanisms, our own way of living which uh, makes us comfortable. People live because they want to be happy, because they want to be <coughs> stable. Some depend on religion, others on materialism, wealth, others from drugs. But for me, the things that I learned most is from my mom. Uh, she taught me gratitude, humility, and to be nice. Three things she says. Dola, she called me Dola when I was a kid. <clears throat> Always be grateful. In whatever you do, Always be humble. Always be nice. And whatever you do, keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, and keep your mouth shut. That way, it says you learn a lot, a lot. And I try to well, live my life according to this advice. <clears throat> so, I live my life with gratitude. And what is gratitude? Gratitude is simply being thankful for what you receive from others, either tangible or intangible. And, and the thing about gratitude is it pleases both the giver and the recipient. So I say thank you very much for opening the door and give a smile. The person who opens the door also feels good. This smile too. So gratitude to me is more other direct than to yourself. It's always to the other person because you depend on the other person to give you gratitude, to make you happy. Now according to Cicero, who's a Roman uh, philosopher, lawyer, politician, he said, Gratitude is not only the greatest virtues of virtues, but the parent of all others. So what is gratitude? Well, gratitude is feeling, as, as I mentioned earlier, feeling uh, appreciative of what the other does for you. But feeling grateful is quite different from being grateful. It's only when I began to read about the science of gratitude uh, that I began to feel the difference between what is gratitude that you feel and what is gratitude that you live with. Gratitude, by being gratitude, by being grateful, is an action. It is a choice. It is an attitude. And it becomes a trait in you. Mind you, it's not easy to develop gratitude. I tried all my life. You laugh sometimes. But it's something you, you, you feel that is worthwhile developing. <clears throat> so gratitude actually is a, is a way to 
for us to appreciate what we have instead of always reaching out for what we don't have. It helps to refocus on what we have instead of what we lack or what we don't have. It teaches us not to take for granted the blessings we receive and the goodness that life has afforded us. <clears throat> now, mind you, gratitude is not all happy. It's not about pretending that things are okay when they're not or ignoring our feelings when things are bad. But it is a practice of re-evaluating what is important for us to focus on. Help us to stay calm, to stay centered, to stay balanced, and hopefully to be happy. And also it does not mean by you are grateful to everything, therefore you stay still. It's not being complacent. It's not being fatalistic. It's not being lazy. On the contrary, when you're grateful, you think of others. Think of how to make things better. Not only for you, but also for your neighbors, for your friends. Some of the things which, which are attributed to uh, uh, ben, the, being grateful, I mean, you can read this in, 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 in the literature, there's just plenty of it now, although uh, the studying of the science of gratitude or research on gratitude is something new. I mean, you read people like uh, Robert Emmons, who's a, a leading authority on the studies of gratitude, or Michael McCallum, also uh, experts in, in studies of gratitude. It develops psychological health, reduces anxiety, reduces the depression, develops what they call pro-social behavior, which is things like empathy, compassion, appreciation of what the others are doing. <clears throat> and it reduces, at the same time, toxic emotions, envy, resentment, social comparisons, pride, worse, hubris. So, these are the obstacles to your developing gratitude. It takes time, but it's worthwhile, it's worthwhile. Now, I've, I've been living with gratitude, or practicing gratitude all this time, and a lot of, or several things that happen in my life, which I could attribute to, uh, which I could overcome, and my ending up here being hopefully a happy, happy person is because of gratitude. I'll give you an example. When I, was, when I was an undergraduate, I started smoking 12 sticks a day. Yeah. Then started working as a journalist. It went up to 20 sticks a day. From two cups of coffee to eight cups of coffee a day when I was a journalist. Yes, eight cups. It, it keeps the adrenaline going, actually. So, to my wife's consternation, I mean, can't you stop smoking? I say, it's not easy to stop smoking, lah, you know. You can talk about stopping smoking, but it's not easy. And you know what made me stop smoking? My son. He was so angry one day because they kept on telling me, Dad, stop smoking, Dad, stop smoking. I didn't stop. So, so one day he just stood behind the door and cried. And said, why, Dad, why don't you stop smoking? 
and that made it. That set the stage for me to throw my stash of cigarettes, my lighter, my everything. That and that. And my year wasn't easy. It was painful. But then when you look back, you were so grateful it happened. First one. Second one, when I was, I was in politics then. It was 1998, one April night, I woke up in the morning at 1 a.m. in the morning. Suddenly, from slumber, I just sat up. I sweated and I breathed hard. No pain, mind you, nothing at all. But heavy breathing, I just couldn't breathe and I perspired a lot. But it all stopped when I sat up. And that happened the whole night until morning. But when morning came and I woke up, I mean, it was this like any other day. I was okay, so I went to work. Whereas in the meanwhile, my wife called my PA then in the office, say, hey, look, this is what happened to your boss last night. Uh, so she, she um, called to SGH, to the cardiologist whom uh, I was seeing then. He said, now look, you tell him to come to hospital right now. So she called my security guard who was sitting next to me in the car. Sir, can you please turn around to SGH? Uh, had my angiogram the next day and went to three bypasses procedures uh, next. Three. That was in 1998. And until now, I, I don't know whether it's my lifestyle or just blessed. I'm still ticking. It's still ticking. I don't have. I have. I don't have to uh, do a stent, which some others did. Many others did, indeed. Even after first stent, even after a bypass procedure, I didn't have to do that until now. So. Well, it, it was really depressing, I mean, to know that you have, got, you have had to go to, for, for surgery. And uh, when I gain, regained consciousness, when, when I felt the pain, you were almost happy. Why? Because, you know, when you are in pain, you are still alive. And again, it was gratitude. So I told myself, you know, uh, there must be some reason why you're being kept alive. So do good. So hopefully I've been doing good all this while. So gratitude really teaches you a lot of things. It teaches you to value things. If you, but if you think about it, you take a lot of things for granted. You breathe every day. How many million times, how many million breaths you take a day? You are alive. When I was a minister, or uh, minister of state, then my minister of environment, I, I, uh, I had the opportunity to see how water treatment works. How they treat water from a dirty grayish, mucky thing in the ground. You treat it, you refine it, you treat it until it falls down clean down your tap and you drink it straight. Till today, uh, I know you, knowing that how difficult it is to treat water, how wasteful it is to just put it in your cup and drink and some worse, you just throw it away. And that's how it, made, he, how it made you feel grateful about things. When I, every time I switch on the light, 
using the switch. I feel so grateful. Why? There was a time when I was so poor that we, we had to live by the gas lamp. So these are the little things, countless things indeed. If only you take the trouble to remember, take the trouble to don't take them for granted. And uh, you feel grateful. It's a wonderful thing. But mind you, it's not easy. You lapse, a lot of time you lapse. When someone gets sick when you're in crisis, you forget me, why should I be grateful for this? Right now in the world, uh, sanctions here, provocations there. Should you be grateful? But looking everything in, in total perspective, try to refocus what's good. Try what can you can learn from that problem. And hopefully you can emerge a better person. So be grateful, my friends. Be grateful. Uh, coincidentally, actually, this morning, someone sent me a... Actually, I don't know. Chow Wing is not here. Yeah, our friend of mine, I mean, uh, we, we have a chat group we, where we, you know, chat. We, uh, we, ex we change uh, information and views. He showed me a, a chair of a TED talk. It's so, it's so coincidental this morning. Uh, it was, there was this uh, neuroscientist uh, who was talking about mind wandering. Your mind wanders all the time. You can't focus. And uh, one of the reasons he says why we are depressed, why we, are, we suffer from anxiety, is simply because we can't focus. And he gave five five tips. Well, it was a long talk, so along the way, it just ended up with five tips. For you to be grateful, for you, for you to, be, uh, to be happy in life, there are five things. Practice gratitude. Practice compassion. Practice acceptance. Practice meaning. And practice forgiveness. All these are part of gratitude. Gratitude conquers all. So I leave you with this thought. And I'm so glad to have this conversation with you. I live in gratitude. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Abdullah Tamuji. Um, also thankful for many things. It's now uh, question time. Um, along the aisles, there are two microphones. Um, my suggestion is ask short question and give short comments. I've in fact here about eight questions for the speakers. The first one is for um, Professor Wang Gangu. Uh, someone wrote, I've seen you speak on, in lectures and also on videos in YouTube. You can speak without a script, and you don't need any PowerPoint, you know. and you appear so calm and serene. Do you practice meditation? Actually, no, no. But I do, of course, uh, think about what I want to say and what I think I should say. But uh, I don't know. Uh, how to explain it, but uh, of course I, I choose on the whole, I choose never to talk about subjects that I don't know anything about. That is why I'm struggling to talk about aging. <laughs> but most of the time when I do lecture, I do lecture on things that I, I know quite well. So a lot of it uh, is accumulated in you because uh, I'm, I've been around a long time and I've uh, I've read a lot and I've learned a lot. And one of the things that I, I do think mattered a lot was the fact that I was a teacher. And uh, in fact, someone actually accused me of always speaking for 50 minutes and uh, switching off and switching on. 
uh, sort of out of habit because over the years of teaching, our lectures are always 50 minutes. And uh, you, in the, when I started, I had to prepare very carefully. I would have the whole thing probably written out. And uh, for the first few years, I think I did most of that. But over time, I found it was not necessary. And not only that, I found that actually, I found it I could speak better without reading. At least that's how I, so I tried it. And when I found I could do it, and I did it more often, I guess, again, it's practice making perfect. But I, I believe that my profession as teacher was one of the reasons why I'm, I think I'm still here, because I enjoyed it. And it was something that um, I think quite young I discovered that I, I had a kind of natural curiosity about things. And particularly in this case, uh, in my, because I took to history, of course I got very curious about history. And one of the problems about history is that it's a hell of a lot of history. Uh, every country, everybody has got history. If, once you get curious, it almost never stops. You just go on uh, picking up, following up things and so on. And I learned that you can learn a lot of things, and some things are very hard to remember. So you learn to try and remember them because they're hard to understand. You learn to remember them so that you, you don't forget the next time. Or sometimes I'm curious, I find that I had something that I was looking up, I looked up several times before, I've forgotten. But because it's important, then I realized that I, I, I should remember it. Then, then I discovered another thing which I think probably helps, and that is that as a teacher, I got used to the idea that one of the joys of teaching is to be able to pass on what you learned. And in order to pass on what you learned, you've got to make it interesting to your students, and you have to make it simpler. Because what you learned from books and here and so on, sometimes are very complicated, very involved arguments, mm. and lots of details and so on, which are, if you try to read them all out, would just bore, tear, bore them to tears. Mm. So I think just by habit, I learned to pick and choose mm. the things which I think are important, mm -hmm. the things I should transmit, as it were, mm -hmm. to my students and not take too much time over the details, but encourage my students to go and read for themselves. Mm -hmm. So to, to, go out, to pick the big, big picture, as it, get, get the big picture right mm -hmm. and pick some specific things which, were, which I hope will stimulate interest and in other people's, my students' own curiosity mm -hmm. would be my primary job. Mm -hmm. I think over the years that's what I, I did. Mm -hmm. And so professionally that is made me do what I do. Mm. However difficult the subject, I must try and understand it first. Mm. And if I understand it, how can I put it in some simple and interesting way for my audience? Mm. And this, I think, over years, it's just mm. become mm. something you, you do right. more naturally. So I don't have a secret right. for that. So, uh, <laughs> so you, you never went for any kind of um, meditation classes to speak so calmly and serenely. Um, maybe I'll ask um, Mr. Abdullah Tamuji. He's a, he's a student of um, Madam Wi Gok Hua on mindfulness meditation. Does it help you, uh, uh, Mr. Abdullah? Oh, yes. Uh, well, uh, I've been trying to practice meditation. My, my, my guru is there. Sifu, uh, it is, it's not any meditation, but what we call mindful meditation, really, you know. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sifu, just, you know. Uh, and mindful meditation, I, I, I try to do it daily, actually, about 10, 15 minutes, simple, just sitting down and uh, empty your mind and concentrate on something, you know. S concentrate on the present now. Don't think about the future, don't think about the past, but the present clear your mind and you and feel the things around you I do mindful meditation uh, almost every day I try to at least mm -hmm. and I do mindful walking too again under the tutelage of my Sifu now mindful walking is quite different from normal walking is when you walk you literally feel how your feet how your foot touches the ground you could feel it how your toes meet the ground. 
how your hands move and how the wind blows the sweat on your arms. Really, really mind when you think of your surrounding you, 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 you notice everything almost. The trees, the leaves, the stones, the rocks. And in my view, I mean in my case, I, I can walk a length of rope every day or every hour. But it's the same way, the same road. But each time I walk is the same and yet it's different. Because you begin to notice the leaves here twist differently than yesterday. The branch we used to be there yesterday is now no more. I mean you notice things mindful all the time thinking about your surroundings don't think about what i'm going to do what i'm going to eat for lunch what i had for breakfast no just think of the present and you concentrate you focus your mind it's emptying at the same time but filling it at the same time with all with all your senses literally you know your brain your eyes your ears your skin and that's how it is mindful so, right uh, sifu okay. so i see uh, gyokhua is uh, nodding ahead and uh, and so since it's benefited you so much, um, Mr. Abdullah, would you suggest to the present Speaker of Parliament, Mr. Tan Chuan Jin, that uh, all the parliamentarians should come to the Mind Science Centre and to be taught by Mrs. Wee Gyok Hua on mindfulness meditation? Uh, let me just say you might regret that. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I, I think it's up to, to, really, I mean, it's not a question of summoning you to do things. It's a question of whether you buy in yourself, you, know, you believe in it, because it, it requires some effort, really. Because the, the tendency for the human mind is when you think of something, when you do something, your mind wanders. Precisely the, the, about the, 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 the neuroscientist I spoke about. It wanders around, it gets distracted all the time. So you've got to pull it back to concentrate and focus on what you are doing. Present. So there are so many of your walkers in this room, uh, Sing Ling, Ing Hyong, and they all begin to love the rainforest, you know, and um, so this walking through stir up a sense of compassion. They begin to care for some of your friends in that group, some of them are widows and widowers, to help them out. And they begin to love the rainforest. In fact, they donated 60 trees to the national parks. And so this project was uh, presented at the World Congress and the chairman was very happy because he said that this should be a small part Singapore can do for the world in climate warming. You know? And uh, the chairman was somebody from Brazil. He, he, he told us that Singapore is probably... The, the rainforest in Brazil, the Amazon rainforest, is 30,000 times the size of Singapore and people are burning it down. You know? And it's one of the causes of global warming. If you all can bring this message, you have done something wonderful for the world. I think the Mind Science Center gave that kind of contribution. So my next question is also to uh, Professor Wang. Uh, you've written a wonderful book. How many of you have read this book? Home is not where we are. It's where we are. Um, right, it's a wonderful book and it's written about his life. Um, so I'm wondering whether, is that a form of narrative therapy? You write something, it is therapeutic to you. It makes you feel better, able to resolve some anger in your past experiences, uh, the sadness, able to write down. Does it help you in terms, does it become a bit, a bit therapeutic now? I have to admit that until I wrote those two books about home, I've been writing books about history. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they don't do that to me. They, yeah. they, they're just professional work which mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. try to tell a story about some event or some mm -hmm. problem in the past. So I've been writing a lot all my life, but I, it, never, it never gave me that kind of satisfaction, not, not to me personally. Mm -hmm. It was a job to be done. So this, writing these two books have been a different experience, to be honest. And as I do explain in the books, it came really because of my wife. Uh, my wife, uh, when she was about 70 years old, she, when she lost her mother, and she was thinking about her mother, whom she greatly loved and greatly admired, she then realized that 
there was a lot of things about her mother she didn't know. And she realized the reason was because her mother didn't bother to tell her or didn't think it was important to tell her. And she, as a daughter, never asked. She was never, when your mother was there, took for granted that the mother was always there, never asked the questions about her mother's life, which then she recalled she wished she knew. So that made her sit down to think about writing for her, for our children. Because our children have the same problem. We don't talk to them and they don't ask. So she sat down to write for the children so that they would know. Entirely a private thing for themselves. And because she wrote very well, she writes extremely clearly, the children loved it. And they turned to me and put pressure on me to say, how about you? And I resisted for a while, but in the end I thought, yeah, that's quite a reasonable request. Mm. Since uh, the mother had done it, I would do that. So I did the first volume for them, talking about my childhood. And my friends heard about it and they said, that's, a, that's an important thing. Parents should tell their children about their lives. Mm. And this is particularly true of people from migrant families. Because if you lived in the same town for all your life, all your family around you, probably there's not that much you need to tell. But you know, for migrants like my family and my wife's family, both of us come from immigrant families. Our parents came from, from China and uh, we moved all over the place, even when I was a child. So our lives are very different. So, and our children's lives are very different. So to, something to tell them was very, very quite new. So I was persuaded that that is something that parents should be encouraged to do, especially immigrant families, because every immigrant family has a different story. That's and, right. And yeah. wonderful stories. And I'm sorry to learn that so many of the stories have been lost mm. because parents don't tell their children. Mm. So my friends in the Heritage Society persuaded me to publish my first volume. Mm. So I did, because they learned yes. about it. So I did. But having done that, because I stopped when I was 19 years old before mm -hmm. I went to University of Malaya and before, I, most important, before I met my wife. So my friends said to me, how can you stop? You stopped when you came to all your friends, you never mentioned any of them, you never mentioned your wife, you haven't met her yet. So I was persuaded to do the second volume for that. But I also used the second volume to answer my question. Mm -hmm. The question when I said, home is not here, then where is it? So the question that became the subject of my book. So the, in a way, it was partly a narrative, but partly I was answering a question. Mm. Where then is home? Mm. And the title of the book comes from my wife, because mm. when I, we de I decided that I, for professional reasons, I would leave the University of Malaya to go to uh, Canberra, to Australian National University, and we had just built a house and all those things. I, I felt very sorry for my wife and her children to move them again. But of course, we thought it would be only for a short while. Mm -hmm. But I remember very well what my, my, my wife's answer to me was when I showed my regret. She said, don't worry, home is where we are. Mm -hmm. And that became the title of the book, sure. before what my wife said yes. to me. And so that is mm. the reason why I've written mm. these two books. Mm. I've never written mm. anything else mm. like that. Mm. The rest of the time is right. all professional okay. stuff. Right. Okay, I think uh, he, uh, if some of you uh, want to talk to uh, Professor Wang, he was very active during the 1950s. I'm sure you've, you have seen the political change in Singapore, and, um, and it's wonderful to have a chat with him. And I'm sure uh, Mr. Tao Heng Tan, your father, will talk to you and told you that his father was um, uh, a waiter of, in, in the British Merchant Navy. My friend, Professor Euston Kwa, will say, oh, that's cheap labor to sustain the British Empire. You know? So most of our forefathers, our forebears are very poor. There's a story to tell. And, and uh, Mr. Abdullah Tamuji will tell you in our, the book we wrote on profiles of resilience, the lives of these people here, many of them here, mirrors the rise of Singapore. You know? And um, some 25, some 15 years ago, I was invited to give a lecture at Cambridge University. And uh, one of the professors asked me, um, do you think the success of Singapore is because of one man? And I told him that the success of Singapore is because of leaders and the people. And we are, we are the people, including the late Mr. Tao Hing, 
Tao Tian Sing. And, and the lecture is in fact um, a dedication to all of us, the people who have helped Singapore raise up from third world to first. Of course, we have very good leaders like Mr. Abdullah Tamuji and Professor Wang. You know, so we must contribute to that. You know. uh, there's a there's the last question. I, the time is catching up. I'll ask uh, Mr. Abdullah Tamuji. Uh, in, in, in your walk through the rainforest, um, uh, besides walking mindfully, remembering what we got Hua taught you, how does it help you in terms of your, your friendship with your friends? Eh? Which is very important. Well, well mindfulness uh, is one aspect, I mean to me, one aspect of, of, of uh, how you develop your, the way you think. But how I feel about friends, it, 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 it builds up through my, my practice of gratitude actually. No, because when you practice gratitude, you, you become, as I say, you pro-social. You develop empathy, uh, compassion. At the same time, you, you, uh, you, you stay away from toxicity. Whether it's toxic environment, toxic people, toxic situations, you stay away from them. And that's how I, I, I survive in a sense. Right? So... So, how you see, how you meet your friends, what kind of friends you mix with, are all important. All contributes to your happiness. You know, when 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 I I, I retired way back in 2011, uh, I retired as speaker. Before before I, I became an MP, I had friends. But when I became an MP, some you had, there are more friends who want, or there are more people who want to be your friends. When I became minister, there are even more people who came. When I became speaker, some people, everyone wants to take photographs with you. <laughs> and when I retired, all of them went away, gone. Yeah? So in a way, I, I, I felt, I mean, in, I was in consternation really. I mean, what, what did I do wrong? People <laughs> begin to run away from me. Then it, it dawned on me, you know, that this is how people behave. You know? If you have something that you feel that you can gain something from someone, you go near that person. So I say it's not for me. So okay, so I, I was literally left with a few friends and dear friends at like that. And then, uh, and these are friends, mind you. I can count my fingers at least at least three, at least three, whom I could trust uh, your life and your home to. So, so you develop very close friendships. Um, well, I mean, I'm fr friendly to anyone, you know, everyone, anyone and everyone. And in fact, gratitude teaches you to, to, to be comfortable with everyone. You know, I, I'm used to speaking with presidents, having meals with them. I'm used to sitting on the floor to eat uh, sweet potato for tea. And they seem happy, and you're happy. So you feel comfortable because you accept your lot. Uh, gratitude says that it is one way to be happy. I mean, you want to be happy, you develop gratitude. But to me, it's more than that. To me, it's a reconciliation. You, you reconcile your life with your surroundings. You reconcile, I mean, you cannot change life. You can only change yourself. And you can really adapt yourself, not life adapting to you. So that's how I went out. I mean, well, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm uh, well, I, okay, I'm happy in the, in the autumn of my life. I need, I need less, just like uh, Professor Wong, I need less food. Yeah. I don't smoke anymore. That's number one happiness. And I, I, I live more simply, really, more simply than before. I don't judge people. I mean, I'm less judgmental now than people. Yeah, I appreciate people more. And, uh, well, I, 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 some people say perhaps I should talk more. But this, this saying of, uh, of Plato, Plato, Plato you know, keeps, keeps burning in my mind. Now he said, wise men speak because they have something to say. Idiots, because they have to say something. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Tamuji. Um, in the audience, they are wondering who are the three people, audience that who are your friends. Um, but they all still like to take photograph of you. I'm sure all of them. Um, so it leads me now to thank Professor Wang Gangu, a scholar gentleman. You can see about him, and Mr. Abdullah J uh, Tamuji, a man to respect. So shall I welcome? Um, Dr. C.K. Chong to give them a token of appreciation. They want to. Uh... Maybe also invite uh, Professor John Wong on stage to take a group photo with the speakers. Thank you, gentlemen, for the wonderful discussion and for all your insights and wisdom. And thank you, Dr. Cheung and Prof. Wong as well. Okay. All right. So before we close, I have a few announcements to make. Please join us at our upcoming webinar on memory and medications on 17 November, where we focus on medications and how they may impact our memory. As we also approach the holiday season, we seek your kind and strong support to make a meaningful year-end giving to Mind Science Centre. Enjoy tax deductions of 2.5 times the qualifying donation amount please approach my colleague, uh, William, or refer to our newsletter for more details. As we come to the end of this event, for those joining us online, we would really appreciate if you would be able to fill in a post-event survey through the link sent through the chat. We will now be ending the live stream. Thank you very much for joining us online. And with that, we have come to the end of the 6th Tao Tiang Sing Distinguished Lecture Series, The View in Autumn. Once again, I would like to express our greatest gratitude to everyone for joining us today. If you have any questions, please feel free to visit our website or approach any of our staff. The link and QR code to our website and a multitude of our programs can be found in our newsletter placed in the tote bag. Please also join our community on Facebook at Mind Science Centre for more information from, uh, on our upcoming projects and events. We certainly hope that this session has renewed a passion in all of our hearts to prioritize our mental well-being, no matter which season we are in. Thank you and have a nice day.